Now, at the same time that British firms were hunting for markets in China and elsewhere, the opium trade was still growing rapidly. From the perspective of the Qing, the opium trade and opium usage was becoming a crisis over the course of the early 1800s, largely for four reasons. First, there was a currency crisis. As I mentioned, the Qing economy was a bimetallic currency system. That is, large-scale purchases were conducted in silver, while everyday purchases, think food and going to the tea shop, was conducted using copper currency. What this meant was that, in effect, internal to the Chinese economy, there was an exchange rate of sorts, namely a fluctuating value of copper to silver. If and when silver became more scarce, the cost of silver measured in copper currency went up, which effectively translated into what we might think of as the consumer price index going up. During the 1820s and 1830s, this is precisely what happened. Greater quantities of silver flowed out of China to pay for British opium, and the scarcity of local silver drove the price of silver up. This was compounded, moreover, by geopolitical events taking place half a world away in South and Central America, where the great Latin American revolutions led by Simon Bolivar and others were disrupting the global shipment of trade even more. As you might recall, one of the primary silver mines was located in Potosí, in what is now Bolivia. Simon Bolivar? Bolivia? I think you see the connection. A second crisis involved concern over the opium trade's impact on Qing military readiness. Usage of the drug was becoming widespread, including within military ranks, and this called into question the preparedness of the military. Try to imagine if in the contemporary American opioid crisis, if opioid addiction was widespread among soldiers and how the Defense Department might worry about such a thing. Then there was the larger moral issue. As in many other imperial and monarchical traditions, part and parcel of a leader's role is to look after the well-being of his or her people. When leaders fail to do this, by allowing, for example, their subjects to fall deeper and deeper into addiction on account of an illicitly traded narcotic, this calls into question the very legitimacy of the ruler themselves. Finally, there was a crisis of control. What did it say about the government if they could not exert control over the influx of illegal contraband? In early 1836, a great debate gripped the court in Beijing, all over the subject of what to do about opium. Two factions sparred in an effort to convince the Chinese emperor, the Daoguang emperor, to either legalize the trade and police it, or to wage an all-out war on drugs. Ultimately, the decision was made to launch an all-out war on drugs by means of a multi-pronged strategy. The drug czar, as it were, was a man named Lin Zixu, and he was tasked with conducting something of a pilot program in the province of Guangdong, and this is where the Canton system is based. Lin attempted to secure guarantees from British traders that they would desist from opium shipment, with some discussion of whether or not a compensation plan would be put in place to offset losses. No promises were made with regard to compensation, however, by the time that Lin took a bold and highly dangerous action in 1839, the confiscation and destruction of 20,000 chests of opium. At the same time, Lin Zixu appealed on behalf of the Qing directly to the British sovereign, to none other than Queen Victoria herself. Lin Zixu wrote an impassioned letter targeting the Queen's sense of decency. He wrote, Even though the barbarians may not necessarily intend to do us harm, yet in coveting profit to an extreme they have no regard for injuring others, let us ask, where is your conscience? I have heard that the smoking of opium is very strictly forbidden by your country, that is because the harm caused by opium is clearly understood. Since it is not permitted to do harm to your own country, then even less should you let it be passed on to the harm of other countries. 
how much less to China? Lin explained the Qing's new policy. The Qing would grant a one-year clemency to opium traders from England, and six months to those coming from India, basically to make sure that everyone had had a chance to learn of this new policy before its enforcement. Lin continued, After this limit of time, if there are still those who bring opium to China, then they will plainly have committed a willful violation and shall at once be executed according to law, with absolutely no clemency or pardon. 